Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he had belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Thank you, Phil. What an exciting time. I just really like to be able to preach on Christmas, and it's great to have everybody here. How many of you have not yet opened presents? I'm especially proud of you, okay? <laughs> I mean, you even made it to church before you got the gifts open and everything, and uh, that's really great. So it's been an exciting week this week. Lots of good things going on. Uh, we've had two baptisms this week. Um, that's always good. Kevin Brown was baptized. Kevin, are you here this morning? Way in the back. We're excited about Kevin. And James Ritter was also baptized. He's the guy in the wheelchair. I don't see James this morning. You'll have to meet James later on. He's a nice guy. So, lots of good things. Hopefully you're enjoying time with family, enjoying all the things that are going on, and it's just one of those happy times of year. Uh, usually when more tragedies happen than any other thing. I don't know why that is, but sometimes around the holidays there's lots more tragedies that go on. And uh, that's what we find. But it's a great time of year. It's always a good time to be able to do that. But I'm not sure we really think God's very close to us. I think we think God's pretty far away. And that he doesn't always hear, he doesn't always listen, he doesn't always know. And so we feel like God's a long ways off. And we can say a prayer, but man, it's a long way to where he is. And I'm not sure he really gets it all the time or really hears us all the time. But I think from God's perspective, he goes, I'm not far away at all. You talk and I hear it. It doesn't matter where you are. You talk and I hear it. You do it and I see it. It's not far at all. I see exactly everything that you're going through every single day. And so don't think I'm far away. But we have that kind of difference where we think he's, he's got to be far away from us and he says, no, I'm right here. He's always been right in the conversation every single time. So what do you think of as glory? Well, about the best we can imagine is Disney, right? I mean, it's a place where everything is incredibly expensive and clean. I mean, that's the only time you get clean is where there's, you know, people who go around picking up after you every single minute. And we think of that as, as being, you know, a place where everything is perfect. And that's what, one of the things that we would like to have. But you're going to go home and you're going to look at your house and you're going to, yeah, it's not Disney around here. <laughs> There's too many kids been through here and too much rapping and all the rest of it. So I think we think of things like that as glory, things like fireworks where it's, you know, there's this bright light in the sky. Maybe it's Christmas lights where everything is turned on and everything glows. The whole house has been lit up until you walk by in the daytime and all you see is a whole bunch of wires everywhere. It looks pretty ugly. And I think that's what happens to us. We see glory, but we don't realize where we are in it and that we don't see it around us as much. We see it off over there, somewhere else. Somebody else has got it, but not necessarily us. And so that's one of the things I wanted to be able to talk about. It's more than gold and glitter. It's more than fireworks. It's more than lights and color. 
I think God presents glory in a whole different way with the story of Jesus. <clears throat> so what I want to talk to you about today is after the time when the angels had already appeared to Mary and, and told her that she was going to have a child, and I guess that's always a, a shock, you know, you're going to have it, but I'm not married yet, but it, the Holy Spirit's going to do this. And then Joseph decides, well, I'm not sure I want to keep her because he's a faithful guy, and obviously she's not. But an angel appears to him and says, yes, she is. You can believe the story she's telling you, as incredible as it is. This is from God. This is, came about by the Holy Spirit, and you can keep her. And so they are able to be together. They get married. We don't have a record of the marriage after that, but we know the pregnancy happens before the before the marriage occurs, and some point in there they get married, both of them are saying, thy will be done. Whatever it is, whatever it is that you want, God. And so Mary had said she was in. Joseph decides, yes, if she's going to do that, I'll be in. And so both of them decide to be in a very awkward position for God because you know the neighbors are going to talk. You know people are going to say things. And so they come to the time where they're going to be there and they're going to have this census. And so Augustus has given this time of this census and they've got to go back to Bethlehem and so they're traveling back to Bethlehem. Mary somehow is always on a donkey. I don't know where she got the donkey. I'm not sure how we got the donkey, but somehow every picture you see is her riding on a donkey. It doesn't say anything about a donkey. She may have had one, she may have not had one. I'm not trying to make her where she didn't get a donkey, but uh, there's no donkey in the story, all right? It's just one of those things that uh, we've kind of added over the years. And as she goes back to Bethlehem with him, they get there late enough where there's no place for them to be able to stay, and so we know the story. They stay in the stable. Most likely there are no animals in the stable. I know our pictures always show these nice peaceful animals standing around watching. And they're all cute and cuddly, including a donkey. But I don't think there's any donkey there. And there's probably no other animals there because we know shepherds are out with sheep. Sheep are not in the stable. And cows are probably out in pasture. And so it's probably not around this time of year. But you celebrate a birthday not on the day right? You have to push the party a couple of days because you don't have that day off. And so we're about four or five months off. Uh, just, you know, that go with it, okay? That's just what happens. And so you see them coming to the time in Bethlehem and they are registered and they're there. And I really think we would have been very happy with Augustus being the place where they came to because he has a really nice palace. And he has really nice stone floors. And he has really nice rooms for them all to stay in. And they would have been treated like royalty there. But that's not God's plan. He doesn't even get them to the inn. He gets them to the barn. And so Jesus is born in the barn. That's not exactly where we would think. But apparently arrangements fall through. All you ladies... Joseph is our excuse, okay? Sometimes plans just don't work out. And you had all this planned right, and somehow it didn't happen right. And there they are. They're making the best they can of what they have. And so the baby is actually born in the barn. I think they're two pretty scared kids. They don't know where they're going. They don't know what's going to happen. They know something is, is very, very strange here. And so they laid the child in a manger because there's no place. It's hard to imagine what that child is like. I think he looked like every other child, but with the appearance of angels and everything else, you've got to be thinking, this is the Son of God? This is God in, in flesh, and yet he can't do a single thing for himself. He just cries for everything. For everything that he needs to have done, he can't feed himself, he can't change himself, he can't do anything. 
And we see the royalty and the glory in such a small child and in such a dirty place. God reveals uncommon glory in very understated ways because a king has been born in a stable and the holy God is in the arms of a newlywed teenager. And it's such a contrast between importance and circumstance. And we're able to see what God does because he's almighty God. He's going to be called the son of man. And that's so that we can relate to him. He is divinity in the dust. He's worthy of glory, but it's such an uncommon way. And so the story continues in Luke 2 and verse 8. It says, in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over the flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. <clears throat> for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And so shepherds are out in the field. They're not in the barn. They're not right there near town. It's warm enough where they're out in the field with them. And this, they're the, they're the guys who are pretty rough. You know how we talk about the fishermen. Shepherds were the rough guys of the day. They're the cowboys. They're the ones who are... Uh, the ones you probably wouldn't want to be around or wouldn't want your kids to be around. Don't listen to shepherd jokes. I mean, that's just all you want is to say, you know, let's don't be so much around these. And it's odd that angels appear to them. And one comes and says, there's good news, a great joy, a Savior's been born. What a great thing to be able to announce. And they're suddenly after that there's all kinds of angels who are there and and it's just like they couldn't wait one gets to come and announce it guess what and he comes and gets to announce that a savior's been born and then all the other ones crowd in and show up and they're singing glory to God in the highest and what a huge thing what a huge thing it is that they're able to announce here with this a Savior has been born for you, who's Christ the Lord. And then notice what happens. But what you're going to find is a baby. What you're going to find is a baby. What a contrast. A Savior and Christ the Lord, and what you're going to find is a baby. And he just looks like a baby. But that's what he's trying to show them, and that's what he's trying to tell them. There's this great, important thing that has happened and yet I don't think we really see it. I don't think we really quite understand what happens with all of this. And as those angels are singing, it's a concert for shepherds. It's not a concert for important people. It's a concert for shepherds. And Jesus is born among the ordinary as the heavenly host comes to celebrate. I think what happens is when the dirt and grime of everyday life meet the glory of the heavenly host, we are amazed at his majesty. And you have to put all of those together. We don't like a God who gets his hands dirty. We want a God who's far off in heaven, who's mighty and sparkly and, and joyous and glorious and everything else, and not like us way down here and dealing with our mess and our problems and all the difficulties that we have going on. We also don't want him watching very close. And maybe that's why we don't want to see God and we think he's far away or else he'll see all the things we're doing. He'll see what we're thinking. He'll see how we really are. Or maybe we can just do the things he's doing. Wouldn't that be better? Uncommon glory to me is when heaven and earth meet. It's the times when the greatest glory of God is, is put into such small earthly things that it's incredible to see. And I think we see that at this moment. It's the most real moment in life 
when heaven and earth meet. Those are the times that matter, the times when God has acted on earth. The things that you're probably going to do today and the gifts that you're going to get today, you know, in a thousand years, nobody's going to remember what you got. But everybody remembers when God acts on earth. Everybody remembers those times. Because when God acts on earth, it changes history. We have something when you walk outside, it's called the horizon line. And when you look at a sunset, everything above the horizon line is great. It's beautiful, it's glorious, and you see all the great colors in it. And we try not to look down below because it's usually dark down below and you usually can't see very much. And you, do, you get all these great colors that are alive up there and they're just so wonderful to be able to see because it, it just looks so beautiful. But if you turn it into daytime, it looks more like this. That's where we live. And we want to go back for the sunset. Growing up in Alaska, it was always great when the first snow came. It covered all the trash. You couldn't see anything but this great blanket of white. And it was so good. You didn't have to look at all your junk for the rest of the year. I mean, it was going to be there for a long time. And this is where we live. This is the kind of stuff we live in. Can we see God in this? It's pretty hard to do sometimes. Surfing, yeah. It ought to be beautiful. Is it beautiful? Well, yeah, kind of. But I think we've kind of messed it up. And I think that's what happens to us is we don't really see God in our earth at all. We don't see a place where heaven and earth meet. We just tell about a story long, long ago when a Savior was born and they found a baby and babies are always great. Babies are always wonderful unless you've got one and then you find out they scream and cry a lot. <laughs> so then they're not so good, but uh, there are very few times when heaven and earth really meet where it mixes together. And I think some of those times we, we see throughout Scripture and we see the, the times and we think of those as great and glorious times. There was a time of creation when God came down and he moved continents and he moved oceans and he put in color and he, he made sun and he made green and he made grass and then somehow he left it out of Arizona. It doesn't need it. It's got enough rock that it's pretty already. But God came down and he made this beautiful creation and you can see where God came and where he did and everything was set perfect. It was all made full grown. It was all made so it was so beautiful before any pollution ever existed. And it all functioned and it all fit together and it all was made to, to just self-replicate and everything was perfect the way it was. And then he put us on that earth. Yeah, it was great for a while. And then there's the tree and then there's the... I think I want to be like God. Wouldn't it be great to know right and wrong? Until you do. And now it's, I would love to not know the difference and not be held responsible for right and wrong. How great would that be? But we don't have that. We will always know right and wrong, and the good news is that God has sent a Savior so that he takes care of right and wrong. But this is a place where God came and God touched was in creation. Another time when God came and God touched was on Mount Sinai when Israel had been brought out of Egypt. They had been brought to the mountain and God came down and smoke and fire and thunder and lightning and just scared those people to death. Because here they were standing before their God and he was coming down on the mountain to give them their law and he says, don't touch my mountain. Anyone who touches my mountain is going to die. Don't let dogs loose. Don't let a goat loose. Anything that comes up and touches my mountain, that's a pretty scary God. And there was so much power. There's this great sound of a trumpet. There was this sound of God. I don't know how to describe it because I wasn't there really. Uh, but what a time to be able to realize that that's what God did. And God came down. He was in this earthquake and it's a fierce time of God 
and how great it was to be able to see the power of God as he comes down to meet his people. And he speaks the first ten commandments from the top of the mountain. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any graven images. And he tells them all of these commandments so much that it scares the people to death. And they say, Moses, why don't you go up and get the rest of them? We're too scared to listen anymore. And so as Moses does, the people decide, let's find our own glory. And the glory wasn't in the top of the mountain, in the thunder and the quaking of the mountain. They decided a golden calf looked much prettier. And they traded the glory of the Almighty God for the glory of a golden calf. They messed it up. The times when heaven and earth touch are times of great glory, but they're also times when we mess it up. And we find God is not able to deal with them there. The next time is, and I know there's a lot more, but when Jesus is born, it's a very different coming. There's no smoke, there's no fire, there's no earthquake. In fact, there's almost no sound at all other than angels who would come and who would sing. And they tell shepherds, and that's all they tell. They tell shepherds. It's a very quiet time, but I think that's when heaven and earth touch. It's a time where God has come to earth. It's a time where God sits there in human form as a baby. And shepherds come and wise men come and kings come looking for People begin to interact with that God immediately when he comes to earth. Very first night, shepherds show up. Two years later, kings show up. And then all people are looking for him. As Jesus grows up, he also emphasizes this idea. One of the things he teaches about prayer is he says, Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What a great thing that is to realize that that's what can happen. His kingdom can come, his will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus came to do his, earth, his will on earth the same way it had been done in heaven. And Jesus is all about making that happen. That that's really what it's all about on earth as it is in heaven. And that's really what he tells us and what he teaches us. That's the essence of what we are supposed to do. We are to do on earth what God would do in heaven. We are to have the message of heaven on earth. We are to see this world that God wants, that God has created, that we have messed up. But to live to the glory of God in the midst of all of the things that have happened on this earth in the midst of all of the trash that's been done, in the midst of all the cruelty that's been done, in the midst of all the things that have happened upon this earth that have been so far away from God, that's who we are. We are the people who bring his will on earth as it is in heaven. And you can see how God interacts with this world all the time. At Jesus' baptism, I think that's one of the things that he's trying to do. Jesus comes to John to be baptized, and John says, I'm not worthy. He says, you should baptize me. But he grants it to be done to fulfill all righteousness. And the Spirit descends like a dove and, and sits on him. I don't know exactly what that looked like either. And then God speaks from heaven itself. He says, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And heaven and earth touch for a moment. And people around are wondering what's happening. But God is speaking into this world. God is saying things into this world. And it was not only at his baptism, it was also on Pentecost at the baptism of all the others who began the first church. Because 3,000 were baptized that day when heaven came close. And God's work is seen. He talks about Jesus as Peter preaches to the people. He says he was the Messiah. He came to this earth. He did signs and wonders and then died on a cross by cruel men. And now he's been raised up. And now his glory because he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. 
and he's conquered death, and he's given you a way to be with him. And so heaven and earth touch again. And the people ask, what do we do? And he says, you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins and to receive the Holy Spirit. And so those who respond are immersed in water and spirit. And they come up to walk a new life, and you realize heaven and earth have touched. It's a place for new life. It's a place of praising God. It's a place just like when angels were singing this now, and all of his people as they are singing praise to God. What a tremendous blessing and what a tremendous place as glory is seen in the saved that were added to that church because they are there and wonders and signs are performed by the apostles and there's so much great love between those people. They have everything common. They shared with each other. They're loving and caring because God is among them and they know it and they feel it. It says they have one heart and one soul and you realize God does that at our baptism as well. When we make heaven and earth touch, and God says the blood of Christ has now been applied to you, and all of your sins can be taken away, because it's not that God is so far off. It's that we can't see him. We can't imagine him. God is right here, and God is at work all through his world. I think that's one of the things the world really wants to see. And I think that's why you're here today. One last passage today from Hebrews chapter 12. He's been talking about the time when God came down on Mount Sinai and how scary it is and all the people that were so afraid. And he says, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better word than the blood of Abel. That's an incredible passage. He says, we haven't come to a scary mountain where we meet God. We have come to Mount Zion. Mount Zion was the place where God had his special place in Jerusalem and where he met. We have come to the city of the living God. We have come to heavenly Jerusalem. We have come to innumerable angels. Can you see them? They're sitting in those blank paces in between you. They really are. We come to the God who is the judge of all, and he hasn't condemned those who have been washed by the blood of Christ. We have come to spirits of righteous men made perfect not to a God who's judged, but to the righteous made perfect, because Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant, and his blood is better than the blood of Abel. It's more pure than the blood of Abel. Even though Abel was innocent, Jesus' blood makes all of us clean, makes all of us pure. He says, you came to church, and church is described in this kind of a way, and you realize that yeah, I thought it was just church. Because I'm sitting here among all the gripey, gossipy people and all the people who most of the time are, you know, will ignore me or say something bad to me or, you know, some of them are nice. The ones on this side. <laughs> but not all the rest of them. You know how it is. He came to church. It's a holy assembly. It's where saints and sinners both meet. It's a place where God is glorified. I tried to find the picture. That's the best I could do. The beauty of a flower is planted in dirt. The glory of God is planted in you. It is what makes the world beautiful. And church is the unlikely place where heaven and earth meet. It's messy. It's filled with sinners and sick people. But it's also where God's worshipped. It's also where praise is given, where prayers are answered, where people are saved, where baptisms take place. It's where heaven and earth meet on a regular basis. And God is among us to do his will on earth as it is in heaven. You may not see it, you may miss it because of all the ordinary that goes on. 
because all of us look pretty ordinary. But if you look close enough, you can see the love of God. And so let me just ask you today, do you have his glory in your life? Can you see above the horizon line? Are you always just looking down at the trash around you? When you come in here, we lift up our eyes. We're able to see above the horizon line, above all the trash that we deal with. Maybe it's time today God was born in your heart. Because Jesus was born on earth as one of us. And because of that, we can be born again to be like him in his place in heaven today. What a great message. It is truly good news of a great joy. If it's something that can impact your life, if there's a way we can help you with that, please come while we stand and sing.